Today I learned scientists have been able to track the history of the AIDS virus. Through a research they believe patient zero lived Cameroon in Africa, and contracted the disease around 1908. After hunting a chimp and being infected with SIV, simian immunodeficiency virus. 1908. If accurate, that is one hell of a lag time. I guess the disease was confined to remote communities for decades. I wonder how many such deadly diseases people get, but die before having the chance to spread them we've been missing? If that first dude just randomly died right after contracting AIDS, there's a chance we might have never heard about it at all. There's evidence that HIV-2 strains have crossed from Sooty Manga Bay, a monkey, to humans at least 8 times. 6 of these strains have only been found in one person, as in 6 strains and 6 people, not 6 strains in one incredibly unlucky person. They are thought to have reached a dead end. The other 2 strains have caused the HIV-2 epidemic in West Africa. There is a sequel? Are you telling me that the story of the Canadian who had X with an orangutan was just a primary school myth? Yep, patient zero wasn't patient zero at all, but patient O that got lost in translation so that patient O, Garetan Douglas, was seen as the culprit for the North American AIDS epidemic for a very long time. Not in the least because of the popular book and the band played on. While a very good book, it did contribute greatly to the myth of Douglas as patient zero. There's a documentary about him called Killing Patient Zero from 2019 which goes into a bit of detail on this. Patient O equals patient out of area. Correction. Out of California. Or O for orgasm. And patient for patients. The virus waited until the 80s and 90s to start attacking people in dark alleyways. I also learned recently that doctors don't use the term patient zero. Apparently the favor term is index case. I didn't realize. Apologies. That's okay bud. I'm fairly certain you can play a common usage card. And everyone knows what you mean so that's what's important after all. Also fun. Not really. AIDS fact. North American patient zero. Montreal Agaretan Douglas is not the man who brought HIV to North America. Douglas was a flight attendant at the time of the first HIV outbreak and when the CDC was analyzing and tracking infected mostly gay men in California they used a system to identify if they were California residents or not. Douglas had traveled to California for work and likely either caught it and, or transmitted it there, but as he was not a California resident, but a Montreal, Canada resident patient O was written beside his name. Patient O, not zero represented outside California. Many, including some within the CDC misinterpreted that as meaning patient zero, the first known infected case. Douglas was vilified by the media and in particular a book titled and the band played on. Politics, People, and the AIDS epidemic author Randy Schiltz vilified Douglas accusing him of being a sociopath who knowingly infected hundreds of men. In David Francis 2016 book, How to Survive a Plorch, Schiltz expressed regret for his decision to vilify Douglas to sell more copies of his book. Schiltz expresses regret in a 2016 book. Interesting. I thought he died of AIDS in the 90s. There was a gay black teen they confirmed had it in St. Louis in 1969. He was suspected of being a child prostitute, but didn't pursue the matter due to the sensitivity of the subject. Gay black teen with AIDS in 1969. I hope God let him re-roll his character and try again. In St. Louis, potentially the most segregated city left in the states. That is a rough freaking life. It's likely that numerous people were infected with SIV, HIV from hunting and eating chimpanzees before it was noticed, but the disease either didn't adapt to the human body or the person died before it could spread to anyone else. It didn't become the virus we know today until by chance a hardier strain both made it into humans and had a chance to spread. HIV has a long history of people being uneducated or misinformed about it, as demonstrated by some of the comments here.
I remember reading that it is quite likely HIV was already circulating in the US as early as the mid-1960s, mostly killing off the homeless and indigent before jumping to the wider population of gay men and drug users in the late 1970s. This wasn't just a baseless claim, there was some evidence and corroboration of severe pneumonia-like symptoms, apparent TB-like infections, and die-offs among transients and runaways. HIV is an extremely well-studied virus. One of the more interesting facts is that HIV has evolved regional clades. For instance clade B is found most often in America and Europe, but clade N is found in Cameroon where it originated. Clade N is with an HIV type 2 which is a less infectious strain which could explain the time lag from patient 0. Clade B is with an HIV type 1 which is much more infectious. I'm a molecular scientist and I find viruses absolutely fascinating. Is it possible to be infected with both strains at the same time? What does the prognosis look like then? This is actually known as Super AIDS. The branding of Gaetan Douglas as patient zero gleefully spreading AIDS on an unsuspecting world remains an absolute travesty. Doesn't matter how many articles like this get published, the damage will never be undone. Maybe he wasn't patient zero, but he admitted that he knowingly kept fricking around 100 people a year and had over 2500 exil partners in his life. He also had a very cavalier, blasé attitude when it came to X and traveled all around the country which helped spread the disease. He seemed like a sociopathic prick. Yes, it is well reported that he knew he was ill, likely with AIDS, but refused to curb his behavior even, as it was booming clear as to how HIV was transmitted. It was also known for a long time that blood being bought cheaply from donors in third world countries and being used on patients in the US was being done in unsafe conditions and was spreading AIDS. Didn't stop the practice for far too long and was a massive contributor to the spread of AIDS. How does one possibly have the X appeal to have that many partners? Asking for a friend. How did he have over 2500 total exil partners at a rate of 100 per year, but died at 31? I just read the hot zone. One theory suggests it emerged kind of like COVID-19 due to the wet markets. There was a market for primates. These animals, in turn, were being jammed together in cages, exposed to one another, passing viruses back and forth. Furthermore, different species of monkeys were mixed together. It was a perfect setup for an outbreak of a virus that could jump species. I love that book, and Demon in the Freezer, but be aware that it significantly sensationalizes the events it covers. I work in infectious diseases, Ebola and Marburg specifically, and usually this book is brought up as kind of a joke for this reason. I read that book when I was 11 and wanted to be a microbiologist ever since. It may have been exaggerated, but it definitely solidified my interest in STEM careers. Just to point out my error in the original post, AIDS virus is incorrect. It should just be AIDS. That was a mistake on my part when I was typing and I apologize if it causes confusion. Thanks. And Belgian slavery brought it to more populated areas. There was an excellent doku on I read about it a few months back, probably still online, in the 1900s. That makes sense. I just read about a couple cases of HIV from the 60s. The guy from Norway, and the guy from Missouri that was a suspected child prostitute. Whoa, as early as 1908. I remember reading that it was first detected in humans in the 1930s, and thinking huh, we've had it for a long time, um. I, I think we should leave animals alone. Whoa, that's incredibly insensitive to those of us who just happen to love. Mad cow disease. Swine flu. Bird flu. Now if you'll excuse me I need to finalize the paperwork on my burial plot purchase. The scary thing about mad cow disease is that it is caused by a prion which takes decades to show symptoms. Millions could have a ticking time bomb in their bodies and not even know it. 
prion disease scares me. The scary part is that prions laugh in the face just about anything we can throw at them. Brain sitting for decades in formaldehyde? Still infectious. Ran your tools through normal sterilization? Still infectious. Left those tools alone for decades? Still infectious. Radiation? No effect. Toss the body through a medical incinerator? Still infectious. Prions are scary as hell. If you sort by controversial, you can see a bunch of funny people make the exact same joke. Hunting. Yep. Every. Single. One. By hunting they don't mean fricking. They mean eating. Why did they attribute it to the flight attendant guy? Homophobia? Or was he the person who brought it to the west? My understanding is that he was the first or one of the first to be diagnosed and was also very cooperative with researchers so he became pretty well known for that. He was given a code name of sorts, which was patient O, the letter, not the number, which was misconstrued by the media. The idea that he was a promiscuous homosexual sociopath who spread the virus knowingly or intentionally was really pushed by the media and especially by Randy Schiltz in his book and the band played on. He was smeared by journalists as the man who brought AIDS to America. He definitely was not the index patient in the US and the CDC never claimed that he was. Modern research shows that HIV probably came to America in the 1960s from the Caribbean. He wasn't even among the first. People had been dying of AIDS for years before he got to the US. Funny how racist all these comments are. I don't care if I lose karma, but it must be said. Pandemics in a nutshell. Some pool sap in a third world country went can I eat this? Not necessarily. 1918 Spanish flu, 1957 Asian flu, 1968 Hong Kong flu, 2009 swine flu all came out of North American and Eurasian animal agriculture. First world animal agriculture is responsible for a number of devastating pandemics. The Africans who eat bush meat eat it, because it is cheaper than farmed meat. But for the portion of Chinese people that eat wild animals or farmed non-livestock animals, it's for medicinal purposes and with a belief it will cure disease. And it's actually more expensive, so that the trade of animal parts for medicine is a source of economic revenue for the country. Just commenting, because I think a lot of people are misunderstanding the nuances of the wet market situation in China. I personally think the belief animal parts cured disease is superstitious and stupid, but you can compare it to idiots in the US who use essential oils or give bleach enemas to their kids. Subscribe and click the notification bell to get the best of British.